Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or uneffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a, an emeritus professor, Mustafa Jemgos, part of the Faculty of Natural Sciences, Department of Life Sciences at Imperial College London, and we're going to talk about neuroscience-based solutions to cancer. So, Mustafa, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Richard. Nice to be here. Yeah, it sounds like an intriguing title. Um, tell me a bit about your background and what got you interested in cancer in the first place. Well, I became interested in cancer really from curiosity. Um, what my initial true interest uh, was in neuroscience and specifically electrophysiology. And the, and the reason for that is when I grew up in Cyprus, uh, I built a radio transmitter. And whilst building this uh, transmitter, not radio, this was quite an interesting gadget. Um, we're talking of the late 60s. And whilst building it, I got electric shock several times because we were working with, um, with sort of open naked electricity. And I was fascinated by what this uh, mains electricity was doing to my body and what I was feeling. Quite a scary feeling, actually. And I, this fascination became um, a profession. So I trained, I did my degree in physics and then through biophysics, did my PhD in neuroscience where electrophysiology, studying neurons, electrical signals was my primary occupation at a time when adult plasticity was coming in. Everyone knew that the embryonic nervous system is plastic early on, but there was major doubts whether this plasticity kind of persisted into the adulthood. And uh, and I was I was there in those days, so studied using electrophysiological cells change their electrical signals uh, in response to changing environments and, and and chemicals and all those things. And and that got me all the way to my first professorship. And then I became interested in cancer. Really, the question was, because I tend to believe everything in life is, is has got some kind of electricity. And the question was, two questions. First, do cancer cells generate electrical signals? Now, in hindsight, this was a very naive question uh, because every cell in the body has property. And so the cancer cells, cancer cells are very electrically. The second question I asked, which was asked more or less for the first time, was whether aggressive cancer cells uh, by electricity and benign cancer cells by electricity differed? And if so, if this difference could be used 
all the way into the cloud. And that's how I discovered, sorry, I was going to say, that's how I discovered that, um, that when cancer cells become static or aggressive, their membranes become electrically active. So these cells start buzzing with electrical signals, a bit like neurons in an epileptic brain. And it is this excitability which gives them the ultimately the aggressiveness and the ability to bathe and to spread around them. So that, that is the basis of my, or the history of my interest in, in cancer and the particular type of cancer research that I developed. Yeah, these are some great questions you've asked. What in the body happens in the neurons electrically versus normal cells that are, aren't neurons? Like what does bioelectricity look like in a normal body? What goes on? Okay, it's a good question. At, at the simplest level, it's the so-called membrane potential. So every cell has a fatty membrane, and in that membrane are various proteins, such as receptors, with which the cells communicate with other cells through chemicals and so on. And across this membrane is a voltage difference. And, um, and this voltage difference, you know, we measure using microelectrodes. These days, increasing voltage dyes and things. The, the value is something, the, the, the value is in the sort of few tens of millivolts, it's quite a small potential. If, however, one expresses this um, voltage as a gradient, so look at the, take into consideration the thickness of the membrane as well, which is about seven, eight nanometers, it becomes a huge force to the, to the extent of something like 10 million volts uh, wow. over a meter. And every cell in the body has this, and um, and it uses it for all sorts of functions. So now, as I was saying earlier, our cell membranes are inundated with different um, proteins, receptors, enzymes, structural proteins, ion channels, pumps, all sorts of things. And these proteins, of course, are made of amino acids. And amino acids, some of them are charged. So when the membrane potential, when these proteins with their charged structure or distribution of charge come under the influence of this membrane, huge membrane gradient, voltage gradient, and as it changes this response to internal or external factors, these proteins will feel that change and respond to it. So it's, it's, basic, um, it's basic, if you like, electrostatics, you know, uh, what do we learn at school? Equal charges repel, opposite charges attract. So, and this is what happens. And so as the voltage changes, either in the positive or negative direction, they, these proteins will respond to that, change their structure. And of course, in biology, including in protein, structure reflects function. The structure changes, then the function. So every cell in the body does this use the memory potential to perform a part of their role, including passing urine or something, just uh, move, moving water in our body, or or certainly responding to a hormone and having feelings and all those. What well, I was imagining um, a protein approaching an ion channel, the electric difference, I guess, would suck it into the channel, but it would also deform it. Yes. I, mean, I don't know if it would, you know, if it, as it goes down a channel. I don't know if the electric field would, I guess, act as a, um, yeah, I guess as a channel. It might keep the proteins and other stuff away from the walls and shuttle it through a channel very quickly, let's say, and then out it pops into the exterior environment or and it comes into the interior cytoplasm. And then its conformation changes once it gets away from, you know, the electric potential of the channel. Do you think that happens? I think that happens because in the first instance, this um, fatty membrane um, that, that engulfs, surrounds our cells, is impermeant to water and, and major chemicals. You, you chemicals need to be um, lipophilic, so compatible with, with fattiness to be able to enter that membrane. That means that things like small ions will need to go through the proteins in order, in order to get access to, to the cell interior. So we can look at something like, for example, pH. pH or our body's acidity is very, very important to our uh, bodily function. All our enzymes uh, respond. So how the acidity of our cell interiors then will determine how those enzymes within the cells function. And what controls that are all the ions that are, uh, all, all the protons or hydrogen ions that are going either through those hydrogen channels or being exchanged with various in, in ion extra protein. So, um, you know, it, it, I look at it as sometimes like a puppet show. So we have this cell and we have all these proteins and, you know, depending on the memory potential and depending on what's going on, different proteins kick in. Before we continue, 
I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. And so you have this sort of puppet show where different proteins are going in and out functionally. And and then the, the cell dendrins alert and in, in good condition with regard to the outside um, environment, as well as what it w- wants to do by controlling its intracellular milieu. So fascinating, really. Can I quickly go back to the to my in, how my interest started in electricity? So I got all these electric shocks and things. I did once say to sure. to in my lab, I said, look, all my graduate students before they start their graduate studies should put their fingers into the into the electric socket, and and then they will know what they are dealing with. And this idea didn't go. Yeah, if I miniaturized you. And right. I put you right outside of a cell. What would you observe? What would you feel? If you were, you know, as small as a molecule. And same thing with inside the cell. Your child. Well, okay. I rather suspect it'll be like um, the Piccadilly Circus in London or the busiest um, environment in Los Angeles or New York, Manhattan or something, where things will be buzzing around, you know, a lot of traffic molecules going around being in and out of the membrane also being sequestered in within organelles we talked about ph earlier a part of the 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 way ph will be controlled by hydrogen being regulated calcium also cells will spend a lot of time making sure calcium level um, remains normal so there's going to be a lot of um you know you could be sitting there and within a single cell a lot of uh, activity. I mean, the cell is defined in biology as the unitary functional, the, the functional unit of living things. I mean, these days there is increasing talk that maybe that that's being too generous because there are organelles within our cells that that are functioning um, almost in their own right. So um, it's a good uh, you built you've built a good sort of vision in, in my mind already that you know sitting in a cell you would see a lot of lot of movement lot of acting physical chemical electric yes yeah. and mechanical how, as well how many ion channels i know they have different functions but how many ion channels might a typical cell have that are opening and closing at one okay so the first of all um let's define ion channels there are on the whole th- in terms of their molecular makeup, three classes. There are channels that are voltage sensitive. So these are the kinds of channels that I was describing a little bit earlier. So the structures are strongly charged and they respond to the membrane voltage and they will open and close depending on the value of the membrane potential. So these are the the channels that enable our nerves to conduct uh, and our muscles to, to, to contract our heart, our muscles to contract, our nerves to conduct and our heart to, to beat as well. The, the other type are the ligand-gated channels. So these channels change, the, the whole idea is to change the conformational state of the program, whereupon the function. So the second class are the ligand-gated channels, bind specific chemicals, and then upon binding, change their structure, change their conformational state from which a function follows. So these are the kinds of um, ion channels like the, the nicotinic receptor, the acetylcholine receptor that control controls our nerve muscle uh, transmission and, and our contraction. The, the, the chemical impact can be direct, so the protein can have both the actual channel pore as well as the binding site for the for the ligand, which can be a neurotransmitter or a neurohormone, something like that, or the the gating of the channel in this mode could be indirect through a secondary message. Thirdly, the least understood but increasingly being investigated are mechanosensitive channels, channels that that um, whose main gating mechanism is some mechanic. So, and that's it really. Uh, so the, depending on the, on the tissue or the organ in which these channels sit, 
and there will be one type or the other. So voltage gated channels are very common in nerves and muscles, mechanos and, and, and ligand gated channels as well, a lot in muscles because of the neurotransmitters and then mechanosensitive channels in tissues that, that are under mechanical stress, uh, including so skin and the epidermis. Now, how many channels in a typical cell? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. I would say thousands or tens of thousands. Uh, that's an amazing orchestration to have them open and close. And do you, do you think there's an orchestration or do you think Absolutely. That just by uh, their yeah. method of action that, yeah. that do you think the cell is, is deliberately, knowingly opening and closing them? Or is it just because they're, they're set up to operate based on, you know, electricity or a ligand or another method, you know, mechanical transduction that, it just happens automatically. A cell can have all these types of channel together or may specialize in one or the other. Now, in terms of uh, memory voltage and voltage gated channels, they will tend to respond some kind of synchrony on the assumption that the memory changes uniformly, but not necessarily. I mean, increasingly, as I was saying earlier, we are now using voltage sensitive dyes to study the neutral. Now, the advantage of, of this is we can see local change. change. Using more classic cooks like microelectro, um, you would just see uh, or you would just record an average of the potential. So, what will happen in a cell then is depending on the local change, you may well have one end of the cell respond different than the other. And this then can generate. So say directional response. So moving cells will have different channels at, on the say on the leading edge versus the trailing. So it, it really is. I mean, the body and our cells are incredibly well designed. I mean, mm. I trained in neuroscience, and um, and you know you know how many neurons there are in and. And, and it works incredibly well. I mean, it, it's a very complex mission. No doubt about it. it is, whilst being extremely complex, it is also extremely well designed and, and efficient. Okay. I know the ion channels are used in the affairs of a given cell you know, to, to manage its own affairs. But what about in cell-to-cell -cell communication? You know, in neurons, it's obvious. In non-neurons, how do you think Ion channels are used in cell-to-cell -cell communication. Um, well, remember, non-neuronal cells do not so much um, do cell-to-cell -cell interactions in the way um, that they sit. I mean, I, I say that with a slight hesitation. Um, that will happen mostly by chemicals because, you know, a lot of cells release chemicals. Even our immune cells release chemicals in various extracellular vesicle form. And, uh, and these will go from one cell to the other. Now, if you're talking physically, physical networks, I mean, yes, I mean, our epithelia, our guts align uh, with, with our epithelial cells, they will be coupled in some way. The coupling will then be much more concerned with sort of gap junction, another type of connecting protein uh, or, or tight rather than kinds of channels described. These, the, the, the kinds of channels I described would be much more in the membranes that are not forming the junction because so as to control what is going across the epithelium rather than what is happening. You know, I th these are very deep questions and, you know, the, the, I always hesitate to give black and white answers because, as we were saying earlier, our bodies are so well designed that um, if there is an exception, it will happen so as to um, subserve that role. And that, that is, of course, what evolution... No problem. So, oh, well, last question before we move on to cancer. Has anyone observed in vivo with microelectrodes or by other, you know, by light microscopy opening and closing in channels and items passaging through channels in and out of cells. Okay. Well, I mean, we're now moving into the in, into my active research field, uh, cancer and ion channels in cancer. The answer is yes. The First of all, you, we can look at human cancer tissue and they are full of ion channels. So all the ion channels are, all in, are in all the cancers. So the, these are determined by techniques like immunohistochemistry or immunostatochemistry, where we use an antibody to bind to the channel and make the antibody light up in some kind of reaction. And we, and we see these channels are there. Now, this is human tissue, human material from the clinic, the kind of tissue pathologies would make it. Now, in terms of seeing the actual channels open and close, can definitely see electrical 
phenomena that will result from ionic hack. So uh, we can do tissue bioimpedance. So we can look at the, the electrical properties like impedance, resistance, or the conductivity of tissue. And we see that it's different from a uh, normal tissue. What you want has been done in animal models, in animal models, because, you know, the way we the, this research goes is we do a lot of work in vitro, then we move to animal systems in vivo and, and see if what happens in vitro also happens in vivo. And, and then after so much work on, on model animals, and I say this in the nicest possible way, because, you know, I know use of animals in research is a, is a sensitive issue. People like us are very responsible in doing all these things, very much controlled by ethics and ethical committee and minimizing the and things like that. I just stress that as a... So after growing a, or inducing a tumor in an animal, we, one can remove that tumor uh, and then stick electrodes into the cancer cells in the tumor. And yes, there they are. One sees the uh, activity of the channels as we have seen in vitro and so on. Now, um, Richard, to, to actually see the opening and closing, um, you would need to go a, another step in, in technique and sophistication. So we are talking about all cell whole cancer cells electrical responses as opposed to individual ion channel individual ion channel activity but it's the individual ion channel activity that will ultimately give rise to the uh, to the whole cell risk. and one of the advantages of uh, working with ion channels is the availability of um, specific um, chemical tools, including natural toxin. So I work on voltage-gated sodium channels. This is what I discovered in, in cancer, in metastatic tumors. And um, we have got given pufferfish toxin, tetrodotoxin, which is a highly, highly specific blocker of these channels. So when we record some activity, as I was saying earlier, say in, in a tumor in an animal system, and then ask the question, you know, is, it, is this real? I mean, it looks like a, a channel activity or some kind of artifact or something, using these specific blockers will immediately prove to us that we're dealing with some specific, the activity of a specific protein and so on. And uh, this is, this, I think this is, this is one of our uh, strengths and advantages in working on the bioelectricity of, of cancer, that we have these ion channel tools, as well as lots of drugs that we can enter, in, which, which we are in oh. the process. If you look at a healthy tissue, are you able to tag enough cells where you can see the organization over a multicellular scale of the ion channels? Because the reason why I ask is if you look at a tumor, it's very heterogeneous. I would bet that you'd see a lot less organization. It probably would be a lot more chaotic if you were able to tag enough channels and look at the you know, the macro structure of how they're laid out in healthy cancer tissue. You're right. I mean, in, in healthy tissue... Uh, almost by definition, that is a high degree of organization, regularity. We were discussing earlier on about how epithelia are nicely laid out. Um, even in our brains, with all those thousands and thousands of neurons, you know, there, there is some kind of network structure. So when you look at ion channel um, distribution or localization, yes, we see them very, I wouldn't say necessarily regularly, but we can definitely see them laid out with, with some kind of order, depending on, as you were saying earlier, which end of the cells do what and, and so forth. Now we look at it at a tumor, which immediately hits you by its heterogeneity. So a tumor is not made up of, of just cancer. So, you know, we've got to be careful discussing tumor versus cancer. Cancer is the disease, tumor is the actual physical mass. And in there, there will be many other cell types along sexual cancer cells. So when we do what you were suggesting, say you look at in general distribution uh, in such a chart, then it will be much more not chaotic necessarily. You would need to know it will be much more heterogeneous in the way the channel expression or distribution will be. And then the question in which cell types do these. Have you been able to compare um, primary tumors versus metastatic tumors? And to yes, see if there's do. yet an even more different organization of ion channels? We do this all the time. Uh, lots of other people also do it in the field. And um, yes, 
we did some interesting things happen. For example, when we, I'll answer your question. When we look at ion channel expression in a primary tumor, and let's be specific now, let's talk about the voltage gated sodium channel I work on. Because when you say ion channel, you know, it could be obviously one of many different. The, we're just finishing a, a paper on colon cancer. And as the pathological aggressiveness, pathologically measured or determined aggressiveness stage of the tumor increase, the, the channel expression increases in line. So, you know, it, it's, it's, the channel is kind of following the, the, the cancer program, um, except when you get to the very end and the channel and the, the cells have left the primary tumor to then go and metastasize. At that point, there is a drop in the channel expression, which kind of surprised us at one, uh, because, you know, you'd like to see a linear uh, or positive correlation uh, all the way through. But in, in fact, it makes a lot of sense. And, and we've also seen it since then in model express in vitro. What seems to happen is the, the channel expressing cells are the ones that can met So once metastasis has occurred or is moving along, we, the number of cells expressing the, these, these sodium channels start getting less because they have left the horses bolted. As if. So they're getting less in the primary tumor. And at the same time, they start rising in secondary tumors and metastases because they're all landing. There. Now, it, it, gets, it gets even more intricate because different channels serve different roles in cancer. So it really is, cancer is, is like a, I always say I trained in physics that taught me how to understand the physical universe. But, you know, physics today can pretty well explain what goes on up in the universe post the Big Bang. Then I came into neuroscience and um, I learned there how to try and understand, investigate a biological universe. And the, the brain is a biological universe. I mean, the number of neurons and connections in the brain are, are, are the, in fact, more or less the same as the number of, you know, galaxies and, and stars within galaxies. And then we come into, into cancer and it's a pathological universe. So we have all these things going on, primary tumorigenesis, metastasis, and what the metastases themselves do. And um, so in, at the initial stages, so you're asking, you know, do we see the same channels in as well? Not initially, because the, these sodium channels do not appear to be involved in proliferative activity. So proliferation, so the way the tumor grows, is driven much more by potassium. So that means once the, once the cancer cells have reached their target, the, the sodium channel will have done its, uh, will have played its role will have served its function. And now the, the tumor needs to, or the cancer cells need to decide what they then do. Well, um, two things can happen at that point. They can either start growing again. So the secondary tumor genesis starts, and that will be driven by, in, at least initially, by potassium channel. So this is, this, is, this is my kind of puppet show. You know, these channels are bobbing up and down. Depending on what the cell is doing, different channels kick, will kick in and out. Now, so the, 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 that, that's the first thing that will happen. So the, the tumors will grow and you'll get, you know, second tumor genesis or second tumor, wherever in the... Alternatively, and this is very, very important, these tumors, these secondary tumors... Um, go into some kind of hibernation. So this is these are the sort of so-called micrometabolites, and and they don't grow, and they they kind of sit there, a um, bit like a seed you've sown in your garden. It it hasn't quite died or disintegrated, but it's not doing anything, just sitting there, and 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 it's a clinical headache because it is the, one of the biggest problems in, in medical oncology how to deal with these micrometabolites. So often, you know, cancer patients are told, right, you're all, you've got, you've got the, the all clear. Uh, and then within, within two, three years, the cancer returns. Right? How many times have we seen? Yeah. And the reason it, sorry? No, that's unfortunate, but yeah, I'm, I'm just echoing and, what you said, yeah. And the reason, are the, one reason, are these micrometastases. So, and then, and then, you know, the question becomes, how can we take care of them and deal with them and get rid of them. And the ion channels offer real potential there as well. Because one of the, the remarkable properties of sodium channel we discovered in metastatic disease or in metastasis is that the channel is an embryonic. It's a, it is a, the channel is expressed in its neonatal splice form. Could I explain that a little bit? Because it, yeah, it, what, is, what does that mean? That mean? Now this, it, it means this. So we are all born with something like 22,000 genes, right? A surprisingly small number. So in our 
in our neonate life, when we are neonate, so early embryos, these 22,000 genes are strung or organized in a certain way. So if you imagine a gene to be like a string of beads, um, its stringing is such as to subserve our neonate needs, whatever those are, his tummies. Now, once we are born and start developing, and um, these 22,000 genes get restrung. Same 22,000 genes now get reorganized so as to serve our adult. Now, reasonably straightforward. What happens in cancer is a lot of genes, this is now in the adult body, a lot of genes in the tumors revert back to their a process uh, we call de-differentiation, which is itself a pathology. The more de-differentiate a tumor, the more, the more embryonic it is. No one knows why. Um, I think what may be happening is that the, the, the brain or something in the body knows that this tissue has become abnormal. This mass of tumor appearing in this organ is disruptive and, and says, right, you know, I need to fix this. And how am I going to fix it? I'll go back to my childhood and then start again, rebuild the, uh, the tissue and so on. And for that, the genes switch back to their embryonic forms. And so do this channel. So this phenomenon is good for our research stance, because first of all, even though, you know, we've been talking about electrical signals in tumors, and I can tell you, you know, the oncology field was sort of amazed and almost flabbergasted by this kind of research, saying, you know, what, what are ion channels and electrical signals doing in cancers? You know, this is not brain, this is not cardiac, this is not muscle, this is cancer. Well, we now know that this field of cancer bioelectricity is so well accepted and buzzing, if I may use that word, with, with activity all over the world. Now, I want to go back to the micrometastases, which is because, you know, we want to make these channels clinically useful. Well, we the, the channel in these tumors, including the micrometastases, is an embryonic channel, whilst the rest of the body the channels are in their adult form. So what do we need to do? We need to do some molecular biology and then see what the differences are um, between the embryonic and the adult forms of the channel and then make an antibody. And we've done that. So we've, only a month ago, uh, we succeeded in making a monoclonal antibody that recognizes just the embryonic form. And now we can go hunting those micro. I mean, if we can manage this, it will be a tremendous achievement. But, and, but well, what does the uh, what does the monoclonal antibody do when it encounters a uh, particular type of cancer cell? What it will do is this: so the monoclonal antibody recognizes the embryonic channel, which only sits on the tumors. So the the idea is to give it into into circulation, it will circulate around the body, and it will only bind to tumors, including the micrometer, because this embryonic channel does not occur in us. We've shown that quite extensively. Now, to destroy the micrometer, all we then need to do is to attach to the to the antibody a toxic agent, a cytotoxic agent. So the antibody will, will do the targeting. It will reach the, the undesirable micrometastases, and the, the toxin or the cytotoxic agent will then kill those. That, that's it. That's the idea. And, and I should say that we don't normally, I don't normally like to destroy tumors. The reason is you can actually make cancer worse by trying to destroy Right. Yeah, through chemo, for sure. Quick question before we move on here. If you're able to discern a pattern in the ion channels of healthy tissue, and you're able to discern the pattern in cancer tissue, and you're able to selectively open or close ion channels, could you convert the pattern of a mass of cancer cells in terms of its ion channels back to a healthier pattern and thereby change the action of the tumor, you know, organize it, clean okay. up its room and see what happens yeah. to it? Good question. The, we can do that at two levels. We can, first of all, we can either block the activity or block the expression. So to block the expression, uh, we would use gene silencing techniques, even immunotherapy and so on, uh, and then we can turn these channels off. Other way is to block their functioning. And how can we do that in a cancer-specific way? And this is the way that I'll describe now that we are planning as we speak to put into the clinic. In growing tumors, growing tumors become hypoxic. It's a well-known fact. So as a tumor grows, 
oxygen cannot diffuse in sufficiently, the, the, the blood vessels start kind of failing, and the inside starts lacking in oxygen. This is a major trigger for things like angiogenesis, but also the trigger uh, turns on many, many genes and makes the cancer more aggressive. Now, under these conditions, the sodium channel, which normally opens and closes over a time scale of milliseconds, imagine your heart beating, you know, that sort of thing. And um, this, under hypoxic conditions, the channel stays open for thousands of milliseconds or seconds. Uh, so this is the cancer specificity of the, of the channel's function. What happens then? There's huge influx of sodium into the cells, into the cancer. And this we see in the clinic in MRI imaging. So there, there, you, one, one can do specialized uh, magnetic resonance imaging in which one images the sodium levels in the tissues, not just general appearance. Of and one has seen, these are all published, um, that tumor tissues are loaded with sodium. I can say in quick passing that sodium or salt is actually poison. Now, the following on from this loading with sodium, this, this cell through sodium proton exchange, another little protein that, that sort of beavers away, starts acidifying its surrounding. And it's, from this acidity, uh, we start uh, the process of proteolysis. That means the proteins are digested and the cancer cells start opening the, their surroundings to start escaping. Basic, and they, that's that's how this uh, motility, the invasiveness. How are they constrained in the first place, and what are they changing to be able to quote unquote escape? What's the difference? Well, I think I think they're constrained physically because the, the, there are physical barriers. I mean, the, the, these tumors grow within your organs, and it's physical. There are physical boundaries. There's a basement membrane in our, in our organs. But how is a uh, how is an individual cell physically bound, and why is it not physically bound and able to leave? What changes? How does it leave well, the matrix of its of its background cells? Well, it so happens that cancer cells uh, have this ability to mutually repel each other, so they they they're always looking to move about and to invade or and to escape, possibly to look for nutrition and anabolic support and so on. Um, so, but I think it'll be mainly the physical barriers that will stop the tumor in its place. Um, I mean, you know, one of the ways in which tumors are characterized clinically, for example, uh, bladder cancer or prostate cancer, these are glandular cancers, uh, you know, have the tumor cells actually gone through the, the, the membrane, the boundary? And if it has, that's obviously bad news. If it hasn't, or it's only partially gone through, then th th that will lead to a whole series of decisions. I want to go back to the buildup of sodium and the resulting acidity. We can we have drugs now which only suppress this uh, prolonged current, persistent current, and um, and it works very well both in vitro and in animal systems in suppressing invasiveness. It really is this masses of sodium driven by this um, persistent current that drives metastasis. So we can block it and and, and not affecting without affecting the so-called transient current, which enables our nerves to generate action potentials, the kinds of, you know, blips you see on those you know, monitors in, in, in hospital movies and so on, um, or the, the cardiac function. So we are in very good position through our medication, if you like, or, or application of drugs to really tease apart processes whereby the channels control or the mechanism uh, through which the channels control the cancer process. So, um, so far, I have described two properties of these channels that are cancer specific. One is the fact that channels are embryonic, and, and that is a sort of genetic uh, phenomenon. It's a molecular phenomenon that, that follows on from. And the other one, under hypoxic condition, the channels develop a persistence, which we can also get. Um, with drugs. So the, the embryonic channel, embryonic nature of the channel, we would target by uh, using antibodies with differentiating embryonic and the adult form and the persistent current, we would drug, uh, we would, we would approach uh, using drugs that will only block that part of the. So, so have, have you done this yet or is this still? Well, the, it's been uh, done in animals. We, it's been done in animals and we are planning clinical trials as we, the drug that we're going to test is actually a repurposed drug. So we didn't make it from scratch. We took it from cardiology. It's an anti-angina drug. And this was a 
beautiful piece of, if you like, scientific detective work, which I'm very proud of, because when we were looking to see, the question was, you know, we have seen, other people have seen in MRI pictures, these cancer tissues loaded with. Now, where is this sodium coming from? The normal functioning of this as a time scale kinetics of milliseconds. It wouldn't stay open long enough for this sodium. So we went looking and the, and the possibility was the, the persistent current, the mechanism where the channel stays open much longer. Now, what turns that on? Angina, it's ischemia lowered oxygen levels. So angina develops either because, or in fact, any ischemic heart disease will be this, um, where the, the, if, if blood is not flowing efficiently, the oxygen level will fall. That could happen in arrhythmia or in angina, or in fact, in a heart attack or stroke. Under those conditions, once the oxygen level drops, then the, then the, the channel will remain open and sodium will come in and then give rise to heartburn. So, and then, and then of course we knew that growing tumors are naturally hypoxic. So it really was like handing glove. It all fitted together. So we went, we took on uh, the drug called ranolazine, we patented it on the basis of secondary medical use. It's been, it's been tested in animals. It works very, very well in both breast and prostate cancer we tested in. And, uh, and now we're ready to, to move into the clinic also exploiting the advantage that because it's, if you like, a well-known drug, it, its usage and safety profile and, and dosages and things are all known. So we don't need to go through the ages of doing toxic tests, things like that. We plan to go straight into phase. So um, what, what is the, um, what do you think is the role of sodium normally that goes in and out of the channels? Is it, is it just used to establish potentials for other channels or what's the purpose of sodium inside various okay, cell types? Brilliant question. Now, the sodium, first of all, sodium normally would move into cells. So our blood is very salty, whilst inside our cells, there is much less, 10 times. So if there is a pathway for sodium to flow, such as a sodium channel, then sodium will come in. Now there are then counteracting mechanisms, sodium potassium pump and so on, which may drive out excess sodium and things like that. Cells use this sodium gradient as a, as a source of energy to do all sorts of other things. Um, so this is kinetic energy. It's a bit like, you know, you're letting a rock roll down the hill and that's going to have energy as it comes down. Same with sodium. As sodium comes in, it has kinetic energy and that energy is then used to, to do something else. One of them is to drive protons out. The so cells are very, very careful in maintaining a pH level. Our bodies are extremely well. The other one is, is calcium. Um, we have a sodium calcium exchanger. So this, the energy from the sodium influx is used to drive calcium out. Calcium is very hot in cells. It does everything from, it can do everything from as basic as gene expression to secretory activity. Neurotransmitters are released as a result of the sodium level, calcium levels going up in the release at the release sites, or um, in fact, cell movement. I mean, our heart contracts because of, of a transient rise in calcium. And then the way, and then the same for cell motility. So I mean, heart contraction and, and motels are almost same sort of thing. And now too much calcium, the cells die. So the, the cells use the calcium as a barometer of their of their healthy being. They will they will maintain normal levels, and the calcium gradient is more like ten thousand fold. I was saying for sodium it's about tenfold, for calcium it's ten thousand fold. Very very steep. That means the the cells are working like crazy, driving calcium out to keep the, the level low and then regulate it from that low level to perform all these functions. Well, that energy for driving the calcium out comes from calcium, the sodium battery. And the same goes for neurotransmitters and a lot of the things that cells uptake. Anything that needs, I wouldn't say anything, uh, because we have ATP, our energy-rich molecule that, that, that is also used, obviously, as a source of energy cells to function. But a non-AT, energy-requiring mechanism, like these chemicals going in and out of cells in order to maintain homeostasis, that a lot of those will depend on sodium, on the sodium gradient. Okay. Well, very good. Mustafa, we're, we're just about out of time, unfortunately. I mean, I know there's a lot more to talk about. What, 
What's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Where can they go? I know you're emeritus, but it sounds like you're still very active. What What are you currently doing? Well, emeritus in London means I remain a member of Imperial College. The only thing I don't do at the moment is uh, is teach, which I sometimes miss. Um, not so much at the moment because everything is done by videos and pre-recorded and things like that. People can contact me. I'm obviously on Google. I don't do much in the way of blogs and things or or on PubMed. I mean, if people are interested in my science, we are on PubMed. We very, I mean, I would love to hear from both scientists and, and patients. The, our work relates to the now and, and experience has taught me to get into integrating certainly both to drugs as well as some natural compounds, many of which work on ion channels because we know they do. So, um, yeah, I mean, in this world of communication, I think no one will have difficulty finding me. Okay. And, and I look forward to hearing from enthusiasts or anyone, really. Very good, Mustafa. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Richard. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.